If you have your own copy of God's Word, could you take it and open with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 16. As you're turning there for a moment, I want you to think in your hearts and in your minds about Jesus Christ and what you know about him this morning. Jesus, as you know, founded his church. That's why we've gathered this morning. He purchased his church, and we're celebrating that event this morning. And now the scriptures tell us that Jesus Christ ever lives for his church. So Jesus, when you think of him, is all about the church. So what would be his complete focus if he is ever living to intercede for us? Of course, it would be that he is building his church. That's Christ's focus. So Christ's priority, his focus, his activities, all that that we know from the word about our Lord Jesus Christ is centered on the church. That's where the action is. That's what's most important to him. That is what he is spending uh, his attention on right now, his church. Now for a moment, think of us who are here. We're here because we acknowledge that Jesus loved us, he bought us, he saved us, he cleansed us, and now Jesus says, I want you to focus your attention now that I bought you and cleansed you and saved you and gave you eternal life. I want you to focus your attention on what is most important to me, the one who loved you and bought you and ever lives for you. So if we think about Jesus Christ and what he thinks is worthy of his attention, which is his church, do we similarly share that same priority, that same focus of life? In fact, I'd like to ask you this morning, how are you doing at building your life, your priorities, your schedule, your time, your investments around what Jesus says is most important to him? And Jesus said the most important thing to him is his church. And if we love him, the most important thing to us should be what? His church. Because who you love, you want to honor and you want to to imitate and be like them. And the reason I'm asking you this is that our Lord Jesus Christ says we lose something when we're not engaged in what he thinks is most important. So think about that. Jesus Christ said, I bought you, I loved you, I'm ever living for you, and I I have a focus and I want you to share my focus, and if you don't share my focus, there's something that you're gonna lose. Something that's very important to me, should be important to you. Well, to help us keep Christ's focus, Jesus left his church an ordinance. Uh, An ordinance is an authoritatively left command for us to follow, and that is a celebration of what we're doing this morning, the Lord's table, the Lord's supper, or communion. We've gathered to celebrate this morning those things. In fact, we we often gather. People say, oh, we're going to the Lord's Supper, even if it's at lunchtime. Or, oh, we're going to the Lord's table, even though we don't even have a, a table in front this morning. When I grew up, there was always a little table in front. And what does it say on the front, right in the wood? This, do, in remembrance of me. I mean, it wasn't a church without that. And, and the, the setup here, we don't even have that. But we call it by a third name. We call it the Lord's Supper. We call it the Lord's Table. What's the third thing we call it? Yeah, communion. Do you ever wonder why we call it communion? It's the verse you open to. It's the only place in the Bible it's called communion. And I want to really emphasize that this morning. Because the only place in the Bible where what we're doing this morning is called communion is in 1 Corinthians 10, 16. And twice it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, this, this, concept of what we're doing. And I want to really, it's our intent this morning, seeing what it is that we're celebrating, that we were given an ordinance, a commandment, an ongoing celebration of communion. Now, if you have the King James, New King James, which is what I'm reading from this morning, this is what it says. The cup of blessing, which we bless, is it not the, and there's that word, communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the, and there is the word again, communion. Both of them are the Greek word koinonia. If that rings a bell, I'll be emphasizing that later. That's the word actually that's most often translated in the New Testament as fellowship. Okay, so communion, fellowship, 
okay? Uh, the communion of the body of Christ. Now, if you're in the NIV, it says, is not this cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a, and what does your Bible say? Participation. Same idea. The word means that. Communion, koinonia, fellowship, means not spectatorship, but what? Participation. Uh, that, that's significant. That's a great rendering of that word. A participation in the blood of Christ. And is not the bread, continuing in the NIV, that we break a participation in the body of Christ. Now, another version, which many of you have, is the New American Standard. So the King James, New King James, it says communion. The NIV says the participation. Now, if you have an NAS, it says, is not the cup of blessing which we bless a what? What does your Bible say? Sharing. Yes, a sharing in the blood of Christ. Isn't that fascinating? One Greek word, it's the same in all of them. It's the same manuscript all these translations were translated from. One Greek word, the word koinonia, means communion. That's authorized version and the update of the authorized version. It means a participation, NIV. It means a sharing. Wonderful, wonderful, all are perfect renderings. Continuing in verse 16 in the NAS, is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? So what we're doing is we've gathered this morning to affirm that we are in communion with Christ. We are in participation with Christ. We are in a sharing with Christ. That's what we've gathered to do. We're not spectators. By coming here, we're not observing something. We're saying that we're participating in it, that we're sharing in it, that we're communing with him. That's the message. Because all of this is based on the little word koinonia, or communion. And that's how Paul describes the Lord's Supper. He said the Lord's Supper is not merely an event. He said it is an activity of us reaffirming our participation with Christ. But he uses that word to also say what we're commanded to do with each other. Communion is a reminder not only that we have participated with Christ, that we are sharing with Christ, that we are communing with Christ, but it's an affirmation that we're also participating with one another, communing with one another in the body of Christ, sharing in one life together in the body of Christ. So every time you come to communion, it's not to do something or to watch something, it's to declare that you are a part of something. And that part of something on earth is intricately and, and marvelously connected to Jesus Christ, who bought us, and entered us into his family. So think about that with me this morning. The instant that you and I were saved, we were joined to Christ's church. Think back of when it was you were born again or saved. At that very instant, the very instant of your salvation, just like that, you joined the church. Now some of you are saying, I didn't. I was all alone. I was, in, I was in the military, I was in school, or I was sitting somewhere, or I was in my car, or... or as uh, one of the people I always will remember, uh, one of the rowdiest people I ever pastored in New England, I mean, one of these hellion motorcyclist people, got saved reading Hal Lindsey in the bathroom. I mean, he'll never forget where he was saved. Someone left the late, great planet Earth in the bathroom of some public place, picked it up. It doesn't matter where you were. That instant you came to Christ, you joined Christ's church. We have to think about that for a moment because it's not just the local visible assembly where you attend, but Christ's church, his body, the general assembly of justified ones enrolled in heaven. Gathering as local assemblies is just our obedience to what Christ said. You can be a Christian without attending a local church. You can be a Christian without attending a local church your whole life. Now, you won't be an obedient one, and you won't be a blessed one, and you won't be one that's fulfilling all things Christ left us to do, but you can go to heaven without going to church. 
but you do have to be a member of Christ's church. That's the universal, the body that he bought and paid for, and the instant that you and I are saved, we become instantaneously a member of his church. And that should play out in the visible joining a local assembly if we want to be obedient, and especially if we want to be blessed and rewarded. But all through our lives as believers, Jesus tells us our eternal rewards in heaven are closely tied to how we invest our time while we live on earth in Christ church. So I want you, we're going to have an investment meeting. I talked to someone recently, they just got back from the Horton School of uh, Business. Well, this is going to be Christ's School of Business this morning. How are you doing at investing in the only thing Jesus said is going to give rewards on this planet? His church. That's, the, that's where the action is. That's what he's involved in right now, his church. He's building his church, and he saved us to be a part of his church, and he saved us to be a part of what he is doing, and if we love him, we should be in step with him. This morning, I have a question for each of us to answer, just in your heart and your mind. What are you going to lose if you fake it this morning? And you don't do what we're, we're called to do this morning, and that is to celebrate communion. Remember what communion is? It's participation. It's sharing. It is, it is our sacred duty of our union with Christ and with each other. What are you going to lose if you just fake it and just play church and don't really do that this morning? I don't mean that you just let the tray go by. I'm not talking about whether you go through the motions of grabbing a little piece of bread and grabbing a cup. I'm talking about are you doing what it symbolizes? Are you participating? Are you participating in the lives of other believers? They're actually Christians that think that they can go through life and make it happily and get Christ well done, and they never have to bother with other people. They never have to obey the vast majority of the New Testament, which is written about our responsibilities to each other. That's what we're going to look at this morning. Jesus Christ warns us that we will lose our rewards at his judgment seat if our time we were given on earth to invest in his church is wasted. Now turn with me back to 1 Corinthians 3. Okay, you're in 10, go back 7. Okay, that's rare for me to go that direction in the Bible, but we're going to be different this morning. I always like to go to the right so people never get lost and just you know, keep turning pages toward the end. But go backward to chapter 3. The whole message of Paul to the Corinthians was to invest in Christ's church. And 1 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 5, is all the way down through verse 18, is a message about building our life on what will last. In fact, the the emphasis comes to, to this in verse 13, and he says, what you've done, how much of your life you've built on the foundation of Jesus Christ and invested in his church, look at verse 13, what you've done with your life, your work will clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test everyone's work of what sort it is and if anyone's work which he has built on endures he gets a reward if you invested your time in what jesus said matters he's going to reward that verse 15 if any man's work is burned he will suffer loss but he himself will be saved yet so as through fire and then he goes right back. He says, don't you know you're the temple of God? You're God's building. You, you are his, his earthly representatives and you are a living stone in the temple and you're supposed to be joined to the other living stones? Wow. God has big plans for you and me in his church. He wants us to make something out of our time that he gives us by investing in his church. Time is like electricity. It flows around us and it remains unseen and useless unless it's captured and harnessed into usefulness. And a lifetime for each of us contains a lot of time. And the Bible that you're holding in your hand, the list of things that Jesus left as our duties... If we love him, if he is the one who's purchased us, if we have loyalty to him, if he owns us, he's left us our responsibilities. And that's what you hold in your hands. And while Jesus is away building a home for us, he gave us a list in the New Testament, a list of things to do with our time to obey and please him. I could divide the whole New Testament. If you looked at all the teaching has to do with us as believers, it's basically three broad categories. Number one, evangelism. That's the part of the list that involves going and making disciples over all the world for Christ's church. 
So that's in the New Testament. There's, there are references to our duty. In fact, Jesus ends his time here on earth commissioning the Great Commission and sending him into all the world. Secondly, an awful lot of the New Testament is about a second realm. First realm, evangelism. Second realm, consecration, or we could call it sanctification or holy living. That's another part of the list in the New Testament. It's all about each of us individually staying in his word, staying close to him, and staying away from sin. And there's a lot in the New Testament that involves my personal nurture, my personal sanctification, my personal abhorrence of sin, and let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. All those verses. But I've only covered a little bit of the New Testament. What's all the rest of it about? All the rest of those epistles, all the rest of those general and pastoral and little letters to churches, what are all those about? Well, the third area you could broadly call fellowship or the word communion comes from, koinonia. And that's the rest of the the New Testament. It's all about our responsibilities to other members of Christ's family. And what happens to be the vast majority of all the New Testament instructs and commands us to do has to do not with my personal walk with the Lord and not with my distant going out and making disciples and and soul winning. The majority of the New Testament is about how I'm to relate to the people that are sitting around the pews with you this morning. And not just how I'm to relate to them, but how you're to relate to them. That's the vast majority of the New Testament Each day a river of time flows around all of us. And when we measure our life in minutes, it can be seen as a constant flow of time traveling by us minute by minute. Now think about this. Here's a summary of how much time we get in our lives. One year is a half a million minutes. Some of you, when you're younger, life goes slow. Well, that's because there's a half a million little minutes that have to go by, you know, those 60-second little rounds of the clock. Half a million per year. So, your your teenage years last for just under 4 million minutes. And for those of you struggling with your teenagers, you've got millions of minutes ahead of you, okay? Uh, A child from birth to heading off to college at 18 was with you for 9.5 million minutes. And some parents think it was 9.5 million and a half and one too many, you know what I mean, those, until you get them off to college. An entire lifetime average in America lasts for 40 minutes million minutes. That's how long we get. So, before most of us head to heaven, 40 million minutes will have flown by us in a steady stream day in and day out. Now, I hope you've come to the point in life where you're investing your life minute by minute. Because if you're investing your life minute by minute in what Jesus is most interested in, it's in those fractional, tiny investment in Christ's church that you'll pile up rewards to please him and to offer him in heaven. One of the most clearly commanded investments we can make of our time is in Christ's church. That's what this whole verses 5 through 17 are about that you're parked in in 1 Corinthians 3. Building our lives on the foundation of Christ. And Christ is the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone of the church. And he says, I want you to be building your lives with that foundation of my church as your focus. And I want you to fractionally invest minute by minute by minute in my church. Time invested, minutes and hours given to Christ for his church, he said, will never lose their reward. A reward is what is produced by my life that will last forever. Just think of rewards as what you and I are doing that's going to last forever. And all of the lists that the New Testament has that, that have to do with getting a crown or a reward, all of them are connected to the church. In other words, Jesus said, build your life on, on church and the foundation that I've laid and build your time around what I reward, which is all connected to my church that I purchase, that's the focus of my attention. As a part of Christ's church, he wants and expects prayers from a clean heart, worship from a consecrated life, time lived under the direction of the Holy Spirit. He wants us to offer acts of devotion prompted by his love. He wants us to win souls. He wants us to edify saints. He wants us to endure suffering. But if we don't share his priorities for his church, what happens? What happens when we just fake it? 
When we just go through the motions, he said we lose our rewards. Our time given to us on earth just burns up. In fact, it says here in our passage, it it burns up and it turns to soot and ashes. Remember the, the wood, hay, and stubble in verse 12? Build on this foundation either of gold, silver, and precious stones, that's serving Christ church, or wood, hay, and stubble, that's everything else. And what happens when you run gold and silver and precious stones through the fire? Nothing. They just get cleaned up. What happens when you run wood through the fire? You have to have an ash bucket, and you have to put it in and dump it somewhere. What happens when you run straw through the fire? You have these little black things floating through the air, and you have soot just everywhere. He says, which do you want your life to end up being? Do you want it to turn to soot and ashes? Well, the incredible challenge each of us face is, according to what Jesus said, all that we have that will last of our life and my life on earth will be the time we gave him invested in what he thinks is most important. Now turn back to 1 Corinthians 10 because that's really where I want to focus your attention. Because everything we spend our minutes on will turn to rust and ashes except for what has been transformed Christ into rewards. Everything else in our life, Jesus Christ has promised he's going to burn away at the Bema seat, the judgment seat that we saw in chapter 3. So how do we best fulfill our calling in Christ's church? Well, in our text, in verse 16, it says, by our communion, by our fellowship, by our partnership with Christ and each other. We're connected in many ways in life. This is Connection Sunday. We're connected by marriage. We're connected by neighborhoods. We're, we're connected by school systems. We're connected by jobs. We're connected by alma maters. We're connected by uh, shared sports teams that, that we like. We're connected by civic groups. But what's the closest connection? even closer than blood relatives. The closest connection is the connection we share through the blood of Jesus Christ. Because by him we were born into a new family. doesn't mean we leave behind our old family and, and neglect it. If we have two families we're a part of. Our earthly family, our physical family, our, our uh, family through our parents or through marriage. But through Jesus Christ, we get to a second family. We're born into his family. And we are closer than in any other way. And what makes us this morning closer than any other association is what we're celebrating. Christ's death made us one with him and each other. And that's what it says in verse 16. Read it with me again. Because I I want to show you this morning what you are agreeing to. And maybe some of you will think twice about the tray going by. Because every time you participate in communion, you're declaring something. You're declaring what this verse says that we're declaring. And that's why the Lord said, don't let anyone unadvisedly or lightly partake of this. But first, examine your heart if you're really up to what you're promising. Jesus said at communion, I've done everything. I have done and fulfilled my promise to you. Now, are you going to commune? Are you going to participate? Are you going to share actively in what I left for you to do? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 and 17. Let's stand together and remain standing as I read this and then pray and then we'll be seated. Christ died to make us one, verse 16 says. We are to be united and share a fellowship that he bought and paid for. Follow along in your Bible as I read 16 and 17. The cup of blessing, which we bless, is it not the communion, the participation, the sharing of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion, the participation, the sharing of the body of Christ? Now here's the application in verse 17. For we... Who's he talking to? Born-again Christians, believers. For we, though many, and there are many of us here this morning from many different places, many different walks in life, many different states of origin, many different neighborhoods we stay in, many different socioeconomic stratas in society. For we, though many, look at this, are one bread and one body. For we all partake of that one bread. What he said is that if you're saved, if I'm saved, 
I'm not only one with Jesus Christ, that's how I know my sins are forgiven and I have eternal life, but I'm also one with those other people that are sitting on your row that are saved, with the people that are sitting in the row in front of you if they are born again, with the people that are looking at the back of your head right now, behind you if they're born again. You are closer knit to them than your own mother and father and brothers and sisters and cousins and aunts and uncles on this planet. And yet we hardly even know each other at times. And communion is where we hold up the bread and we hold up the cup and we say, because I'm participating with you, O Christ, I'm going to participate with them who are part of your family and I'm going to celebrate I'm going to participate I'm going to fellowship and be one with them now with that on your mind with Christ giving us a symbol of connection called communion I want you as you're standing here to carefully decide if you're really here before Christ are you really engaged to Jesus Christ are you really filled with the Holy Spirit and are you truly committed to investing your life in Christ's church? That's what communion's all about. Let's bow our heads and I'm going to pray a little prayer of consecration. And for some of you, it might be a time to renew while you're here and to get in sync with what God's doing. Father in heaven, we bow before you this moment in the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus. We thank you that by faith, by your supernatural work of regeneration, we are united to your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus. And we have participated in his death and burial and resurrection. And his blood has cleansed us from all of our sins. If we by faith have received him, to as many as receive him, to them, he gives the authority and right to become the sons of God. Lord Jesus, if we have participated in you, then you've told us that at communion we are reminded that we must also fulfill our sacred duty to participate, to share, to commune, to fellowship with one another. So I pray that this communion service would truly be that, that we would commune with each other and with you, that we would participate with each other, that we would renew this morning. If we're believers, born again Christians, we would renew our sacred duty to participate with each other. And I pray that we would look at this list that you've left us of what it means and that we would start this morning concentrating, focusing on what it is you left us to do and do it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. All God's people said, amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, this morning, we're part of a powerful group of people. All of us who are saved have the same Lord, same spirit, same living word abiding within us, the same marching orders of what he has asked us to do. So maybe we need to simplify our understanding. It gets to the point where we have so much truth, so much information, so many facts that swirls around inside our minds, and, and we kind of don't know where to start. In fact, in my Tuesday morning Bible study, I have a great group of guys and I love it. And one of them has this expression. He says, when I, when I come to Tulsa Bible Church, he said, it's like a fire hydrant. He said, it's just at every level, when I go to Sunday school and small groups and when I go to EE, when I go to the morning worship and the evening worship and the midweek service, he said, it's just like, it's just so much stuff. He said, I get spiritual indigestion. I just can't, can't digest all this I'm getting. Well, maybe this morning we need to just simplify how about looking at the people who did not have a written copy of God's word? The early church. They didn't carry around a study Bible with 25,000 study notes in it. Like one of the most popular study Bibles, the MacArthur Study Bible, has 25,000 notes. There are only 31,000 verses. <laughs> On most pages, there are more notes than there are Bible. You know, it's just like that. What do you you got so much, you just can't take it all in. Well, they didn't have all that. And by the way, I have one. I love it. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. It's just we're on information overload sometimes. But when Paul and the other apostles taught them, 
almost everything they taught them to obey can be distilled down to that one little word of communion or fellowship. What's amazing is we think our sacred partnership or fellowship with other believers is optional. They knew it was essential. That's why the early church was so different. We have many avenues of encouragement and support. They had only one, and that was each other. And sometimes we speak of the early church in such nostalgic, glowing terms. We hear and talk about their fervency and their focus and their love that they express and displayed before a hostile world. And we think back about them, and we think we could never be like that. We, they just, I don't know how they did it. It's a comfortable excuse. We know how they did it. Do you know how they did it? That book you're holding in your hands. They were just playing by the rules. They were just living out what Christ and his apostles taught. They had the same Lord, the same word, and the same power we all have. And one of the greatest dangers we face in Christ's church today is just playing church. Just going through the motions of coming to a place, going through all the rigmarole, and then escaping back to what we think is the real world. If you're saved, this is the real world. You're gathered primarily surrounded by your real family. Where you work or where you go to school or where you hang out and play and everything else isn't probably your real family. This is the closest thing to it, especially at communion, because only believers partake of this table. This is the real world. Faking it in Christ's church is when we find this gathering for communion something we often don't fit into and we don't really get into. Faking it, coming to Christ's church and leaving unsatisfied by the all-sufficient Christ. If you can go out of here unsatisfied, you're just playing church. You're faking it. Unedified by the all-sufficient word. If God's word does not edify and knit together and mend and, and, and cause parts of you to work that didn't work before because you've encountered the all-sufficient word, then you're just faking it. You're not engaged this morning. Faking it is coming to church and leaving unmortified by the all-sufficient spirit who wants to put to death our flesh. And whatever manifestation it takes, be anger or wrath or evil, filthy communications or biting and devouring or gossiping or living in fear or anxiety or lust. It doesn't matter what form of the flesh we're struggling with. The all-powerful spirit wants to mortify us as we gather and hear his word and respond to him. The New Testament describes fellowship as the spiritual duty of believers. It means that all who belong to Jesus Christ are engaging in activity involving the lives of other believers. And when we do that, there's great joy. But often the joy that comes through fellowship with other believers is frequently lost because of our sinful neglect of our sacred duty. The Bible never describes the Christian life as one lived apart from other believers. It isn't like we're supposed to get a cabin and go out on a mountaintop somewhere and be alone. Time to time, that's very, very profitable. Jesus did it regularly, only though to come back to be immersed in people. And alone time that doesn't cause us to want to have together time is, is not correct alone time. Christ's body... Each member of the universal church, each one of us are to be actively and intimately involved in the lives of other believers as we gather in local assemblies. Now let's turn over to the first of these lists I'm going to look at. Look at 1 Thessalonians, to the right, and it goes 1 Corinthians, you're in, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, okay? Little tiny one, chapter 4 and verse 9. Because the spiritual fellowship, the sacred partnership or communion that stimulates others to holiness and faithfulness is most specifically expressed in the Bible through a little list of 30 verses. 30 verses that all have something in common. They all have the expression of each other or one another. And those 30 verses in the New Testament have 30 positive and negative directives for us that tell us what we're supposed to do with each other or with other believers. The most frequent, half of them, by the way, of the 30, half of them say the same thing. And I'm showing you the, the one right here that's representative of them. It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 9, look at this. By the way, this is Paul's probably first epistle. 
It's one of the earliest epistles. The only epistle possibly before this is the epistle that James wrote to the Jerusalem church. And this is one of the earliest letters in the New Testament. Fascinating that, that Paul uh, writes about this in the very first of the New Testament epistles chronologically. And he says this in verse 9. Concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to what? Love one another. Have of the list that were left as responsibilities of how we're supposed to commune with one another, half of all the directives involve loving one another. There are three common Greek words for love in the New Testament. Every time we're told to love one another, it's the same word. Now, there are three common words, okay? The first word is eros. It's a love that takes. A person who exhibits eros love often loves someone for what they can get out of the person. This is the love typical of the world. It's sexual, lustful, and it's bent toward me gratifying what I want. This is not the word we're supposed to participate with each other. Non uh, eros one another. The second word, which is common in the New Testament, is phileo. It's the love of give and take. It's the word of friendship. In other words, I love you because of what I get from you and what I can give to you. It's the love of give and take. It's, it's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be friends. You can be friends with the world. You can be friends with anyone. That's not the word that's used 15 times as a commandment to us. It's always, all 15 times we're commanded to love one another, it's always the word agape, every single time. And that is the love that sacrificially gives. There's no taking involved. It is completely unselfish. It always seeks the highest good for another, no matter what the cost. It's demonstrated supremely in the verse that everybody knows, for God so loved the world that he what? Gave. And he didn't just give a little. He gave sacrificially Jesus Christ to die. So it's demonstrated by Christ's sacrifice on our behalf. Can you imagine what would happen if most believers actually lived out the love we're commanded to live? We would certainly see entire cities and states overwhelmed by the same power that swept the Roman world in the church. Love should be cultivated as a debt we owe. That's what Romans 13, 8 says. And when we owe a debt to someone, every time we see them, we think of it. Is that how you look on seeing other believers? I know that at times in my life, I remember distinctly when the banks failed in Rhode Island. We lived in Rhode Island for five years, and they had a crisis and a scandal, and they, they padlocked all the banks, and every credit card stopped working if it was from that banking system. Every check bounced. All the ATMs were shut, and all your money was frozen for 14 months. Interesting. Think about what you would do. I remember what I did. I went up to one of the elders that was a friend of mine, and I took all of our hoarded savings bonds that Grandpa Jim had given us for our children to go to college, and I had a whole stack of them, and I gave them to Alan Moores, and I said, Alan, I'm giving you all of our treasures in this world. Can I have a couple thousand bucks? I said, I don't have any money. He said, keep your bonds. I don't want them, and here's 2,000. Give it back to me anytime you want. Every time I saw him, I thought, oh, I owe him $2,000, you know, and all our money's in the bank. I knew I had a debt to him. When you come in to the fellowship of saints, do you feel a debt of love to those around you? If you ask the Holy Spirit to stir that up in your heart, he will. He wants to. Love should be cultivated as a debt we owe. Love changes our definition of who our neighbor truly is. Christ's story in Luke 10 about the Good Samaritan helps us see our neighbor may be someone not like us, but someone that God put in our path for our help. See, we're not just supposed to cultivate a love for believers. We're supposed to love our enemies and Christ's enemies. And some of those he puts in our path probably won't be like us, and we're to love them. Finally, love gives us urgency. It says in Romans 13, 11 through 14 that the night is far spent, the day is at hand, the day of salvation, knowing that it's later than it's ever been before, and there should be an urgency for us. If Christ rewards in half of all of our commanded duty to one another, our sacred duty to other believers is to love them, we should be urgently seeking out ways to repay our debt of love. Because he loved us so much, we have a debt of love not only to him, but to one another. So how do we do that? 
Let me just read this. We're not going to cover them this time, but we will soon. Let me read you the one another's. You might want to write them down. You know, there's a little pad in front of you. If you've never marked these, you ought to mark them in your Bible. Because there are 15 love one another's. I just gave you one that represents, they all say the same thing, all 15 of them. But what are the others? I'll just read off the references, and you can write it down. The, the first of the others is Romans 14, 19, and we have entered into a sacred partnership to edify each other. You ought to look up Romans 14 and understand what edification means to make sure you're doing it, because Christ rewards that. Uh, Romans 15, 14 is the second one. We've entered into a sacred partnership to counsel each other. Did you know counseling doesn't mean that you have to have a shingle or a a little degree on your wall and you have to go off somewhere? Did you know that all believers are are given a sacred duty to counsel one another? You ought to look up Romans 15, 14. And and if you don't understand how to do it, uh, there are so many resources. I know our Tuesday morning Bible study, we're we're a couple weeks left and we're going right into one of the best books I've ever read about how how to do this. It's the title of the book we got at Shepherd's Conference last year. It's called Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands. And that's uh, the 12 of us are going to learn how to, how to be better instruments in his hand. But we are commanded to counsel each other. Thirdly, we have entered into a sacred partnership in Galatians 5.13 to serve each other. God will reward you if you serve another believer. Fourthly, we've entered into a sacred partnership in Galatians 6.2 to bear each other's burdens. And, and when you come in, if you're just like a, a duck and, and it runs off of you, if you don't walk away holding on to the burdens of other people so that you remember it outside the door and you'll remember it next time you see them, then you and I are not fulfilling our calling because we are not supposed to hold and throw other people's burdens. We're supposed to bear them, it says in Galatians 6 2. Fifthly, we've entered into a partnership, a sacred partnership to submit to each other, Ephesians 5.21. We're supposed to submit to each other. That means there should never be any titanic contests of will and selfish ambition and fighting. I'm going to get my way or the highway. That doesn't go with Christ. We have a sacred duty to submit to one another. And if you look at that passage in Ephesians 5, that is the first seven realms in life that talks about how we are to submit to each other and then husbands are to submit to Christ and wives are to submit to their husbands and children are to submit to their parents and employers are to submit to their employees and employees are to submit to their employers and all of us are to submit to God. And there's seven in a row, a complete set, that we're to be characterized by submission. Sixthly, We've entered into a sacred partnership to bear with one another. That's Colossians 3, 12 and the first part of 13. And bearing with one another, forbearance, is is this holy kindness so we don't fly off the handle when people are not the way we want them to be. We bear with them. We are long suffering with them. The rest of Colossians 3, 13 has the seventh one. We're supposed to forgive each other. We have a sacred partnership of forgiving each other. We forgive one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, as Christ forgave you, so also you must. How did Christ forgive? He doesn't keep bringing it up. I mean, when you come to confess and renew your fellowship with him, he doesn't say, you know, and rattle off all your and my past millions of sins. No. He freely receives us, accepts us, and forgives us. He had already has forgiven us. We are to forgive each other. The rest of them, Colossians 3.16, were to teach and admonish one another. 1 Thessalonians 4.18 is the ninth one. We're to comfort each other. We have a sacred partnership of comforting each other. Number 10, Hebrews 10.24 and 25, we're to encourage one another to do good. That, that's why we gather. It says there we gather to strengthen other family members. When you come, you ought to be going around trying to encourage other people, stimulating them to do good. Eleventh one another is James 5 16 we're to confess our trespasses to each other what is trespassing it's when you get off the road and you go over the fence and and we're supposed to be telling people you know I have trouble I, I keep cutting the corners here I'm walking across the lawn when it says don't walk across when God put a sign up so don't walk across the lawn in life and we trespass and this is an area I, I, I wish that you'd pray with me that I wouldn't cut across the lawn in this area it might be in this realm or this realm financially it might be morally it might be 
anxiety related. It might be overeating related. It doesn't matter what it is. It's just, I'm trespassing. Would you pray with me? And there ought to be a group of people that you share your trespasses, where you get off the road that God has said you're supposed to follow. We're supposed to have a group that we are, have agreed upon that, that, that we have them encouraging us. We confess our trespasses. Uh, James 5.16 and that's corollary with the rest of verse 16 the second half which is the twelfth one we've entered into a sacred partnership to pray for each other and prayer is not just at the moment it's an ongoing thing Paul called it a burden he bore all the time and the last one that I'll mention this morning is 1 Peter 5 and 10 and we've entered into a sacred partnership to be hospitable to one another you know what hospitality means? It doesn't mean sterling silver and china. And it doesn't mean clean house and, and shiny floors. Do you know what the word literally means? Loving strangers. It also doesn't mean having over the old, the old cronies. It means seeking out people I don't know and loving them and bringing them into my life. All of us are to regularly have a sacred duty to one another to love strangers. That's what we're committing to when we hold that cup in just a moment. Think about that. Bow your heads with me for a word of prayer. And as the men go to the back to prepare the Lord's Supper, I'm going to read this list off, and then I'm going to pray. And in a moment, they're going to be passing the bread and the cup to us. And you're saying, as you partake in the bread and the cup, you're saying that I entered into a sacred partnership with God and the people around me. And this is what I've entered into. I'm, I have a sacred duty that Christ is watching, that I edify others, that I counsel others, that I serve others, that I bear the burdens of others, that I submit to others, that I bear with others weaknesses and, and unusual things about them. I forgive others when they harm me. I teach and admonish others. I comfort others. I encourage others. I confess my trespasses to others. I pray for those that I know are trespassing, that the Lord will keep them and strengthen them. And I want to love the strangers that are sitting on my pew and in front of me and behind me that I don't know. That's the bread of communion in the cup. Father, as we bow before you, I pray that the cup of blessing and the bread of thanksgiving would be a communion, a koinonia, a fellowship, a participation, a sharing with others. In the name of Jesus, we pray.